From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today out of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Jim Robb covers the cattle market scene this week. He'll comment on last Friday's USDA Cattle on Feed report. And Jim shares the LMIC's latest report on the economic returns to cow-calf production this year. Then, Sarah Moyer talks with one of the featured speakers at the 2017 K-State Swine Day last Thursday. Swine nutrition specialist Hyatt Frobos offers several thoughts on developing and managing group housing for gestating sows. And on this week's 4-H segment later on, K-State's Daryl Waldron has the details on the upcoming 4-H Dog Judges Certification and Project Training Workshop. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.com. .ksu.edu. We turn now to the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center based in Denver for this week's observations on the cattle market trends and loads to talk about this go-round. Jim Robb is with us once more. And Jim, before we get into everything else, let's just quickly look back at last week's trade. And you could generally say that there was market slippage in just about every quarter of that trade. There was, Eric. You know, we had uh, beef production down slightly in the preliminary numbers for the week, but you know, we are at the time of year where beef is kind of on the back burner a little bit compared to turkey and holiday meals, et cetera. Live fed cattle prices slipped a little bit last week, about 3% down week over week, but still uh, nearly 11% above a year ago. Uh, feeder cattle markets were softer across the board last week. A little bit of the strength that we've had in recent weeks seems to be behind us. The box beef cutout was down a couple dollars per hundredweight, about 1%, but still 15% above a year ago. And that's spelt over into the futures market or vice versa, depending on how we view things. And uh, futures markets across the feeder cattle and, and live cattle contracts were all lower, clear through 2018. So you know, the market did have a, a softer tone last week. The general thought, though, is, is this the sign of a uh, shift in direction, or is this just normal ebb and flow in the markets? Well, it may be a little bit of both. We certainly had a very strong rally in the marketplace. I don't think we have a true shift in direction, but we're probably transitioning to more of a sideways market than a market that had pretty strong uptick, especially in the fed cattle arena in the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. That cattle on feed report that the USDA posted Friday afternoon. Let's turn to that. And Well, it was mildly bearish when you consider the placements did test the upper end of the pre-report expectations. It did, Eric. You know, the, the report numbers did come in within the pre-report range, but these are very wide ranges recently. And that probably gives a little bit of a negative undertone to this report. Overall, the on-feed inventory was 11.3 million head in the commercial lots with 1,000 head or more, and that was up 6.3% or or nearly 700,000 head. That, as you mentioned, was within the range, but at the high end of the range for the on-feed count. And it's been a long time since we've had a 6% year-over-year increase in those monthly numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's been driven by larger placements in recent months. Nationally, uh, we were up on placements percentage-wise 10.2%. And we had the largest placements for any October since 2011. So it's been a while since we've had those numbers. Marketing came in above a year ago, but we had one more slaughter day. But still, uh, marketing's on a daily average basis were the best in October since 2010. And I think we've continued to see some states ramping up in that in this overall environment. Kansas had the most numbers on feed since 2011 on the November 1 count. Texas was up largest since 2012, and a couple of the states, Nebraska and Iowa, in the top five, actually had the largest since this report format started in 1996. So clearly the major cattle feeding states have ramped up their production systems. This is more or less a reaffirmation of what's been uh, understood, that as we roll into 2018, beef supplies are going to be more than ample, Jim. 
Beef supplies are going to be up. You know, we'll have record large beef production in 2018 on our estimates. And also, on top of that, we'll have record large total red meat and poultry supplies. Now, that's not unusual. You know, we often set records in these industries, but uh, we're going to ask consumers, probably the big picture headwind in the marketplace is the overall total red meat and poultry production that the U.S., our output in 2018 It'll be record large again. We take that to a per capita basis. We adjust for imports and exports. And we'll ask U.S. consumers to probably eat the most total quantity of red meat and poultry on a retail weight basis since, since 2007, Eric. Mm. And so it's been quite a few years since we've had those kinds of levels, and that is the concern in the marketplace. The big picture concern as we look ahead to 2018 is just the sheer tonnage of total red meat and poultry that we're producing in this country. And then, by extension, how much we can export, et cetera, becomes very important. That does put the onus on demand overall, uh, certainly on the export scene. And there were several days back now, but nonetheless, there were new numbers issued on September beef imports and exports. And wanted to tap your perceptions on this report and what it had to say to us, Jim. Well, it continued to be very positive for the beef complex, and, and the beef exports have, on a tonnage basis have done much better than pork and chicken have done in recent months. For the month, we had uh, U.S. beef export tonnage up 14% year over year. So we're clearly on track to set a new all-time record beef export tonnage in 2017. That's been probably the most important big-picture demand driver has been the demand uh, coming from overseas customers for U.S. products. So that's been quite a positive story. Certainly has been uh, the demand front, including these exports, has been a key to getting the cattle market where we've gotten it to in the fourth quarter of 2017. You know, there's a lot of geopolitical uncertainty, et cetera, but these export markets are the key. Probably the most important demand driver has actually been the export markets, even though domestic demand has been quite good also. It, on that domestic side, as we round out our thoughts on demand overall, can domestic beef demand bear up into 2018 to stay with the pace of increased beef supplies? Well, it, it probably can, Eric, but it depends on a lot of things continuing to come together like they have, especially in the second half of 2017. Retailers have used beef as a featuring item, even going into the turkey featuring We've had front-page ads on beef items across the United States. So beef has been really a tool that retailers have used to bring people into the stores and into restaurants. Can that continue? A lot of this turns on how strong the U.S. economy is. We know consumers prefer many beef items compared to other uh, animal-based proteins. Um, But a lot of this depends on the economy, and we think it can. But certainly, as we look ahead, we would say the supply side increasingly gets large enough for the next two years that we may not be able to repeat the prices and certainly the strength that markets had that we were uh, kind of pleasantly surprised with in the second half of 2017. Well, Jim, you and your associates at the Livestock Marketing Information Center have put forth your latest estimations on returns to cow-calf production for this calendar year 2017. Just to set the stage for this, the initial perception on that was that those returns would be in the red, but it's quite the opposite story, you say. It has, and I'd like to point out to people, Eric, that we do these estimates because we're market analysts and you know, drivers of the cow-calf decision-making or whether we're making a little bit of money in the industry and forage conditions are two of the keys as we're looking ahead to cyclically cattle numbers and how producers will respond. So we use a cash cost plus pasture rent, but the relative change in these numbers is certainly, as we look back, since we've been doing these in the early 1970s, have been a key corollary to uh, what herd numbers have done over time. And we did expect up until a couple months ago, until we had this very strong rally in calf prices, driven by the overall marketplace, cattle feeders making money, export demand, you know, a whole host of factors coming together. This measure of profitability, again, cash cost plus pasture rent on kind of an aggregate basis, uh, would be uh, negative this year. Certainly, we've had a lot of producers this year that faced wildfire, drought, flooding, and et cetera, across the U.S. But, you know, the pleasant surprise in calf and yearling prices and rather low feedstuff costs now has turned that to positive and strongly positive. Our estimate would put this number, oh, close to $70 per head. And uh, to give it more context, that'll be our uh, 
about the same as uh, profitability was in 2011, well below 2014, for example, but profit on this basis nonetheless, and that does bode well for uh, producers in terms of their financial management, et cetera. So again, a lot of producers have suffered with some Mother Nature issues in 2017, but on balance, the U.S. industry, especially on the cow-calf side, due to these market fundamentals and demand for product, it's turned out quite a bit better than anticipated just a few months ago, as you pointed out. And for further comparison purposes, as you note, the estimate in the positive $69 per cow in 2017 last year, it was in the red to the tune of $21 per head, right? And, and I think that is a relative thing that we need. It is rather reflective of the overall industry. You know, not as good as two years ago, but certainly better than last year and one that uh, it probably takes a little bit of pressure off some of our financial decision-making in the industry at the cow-calf level. But in this same analysis, you take a shot at what might be ahead for the cow-calf sector, and those returns may become thinner in 18. Well, we had about everything come together in a positive way in 2017. And we have to remember that the calf crop in 17 is bigger than 16. 18 will be bigger again. So we are still, uh, these increasing supplies that we talked about earlier are still something that the market will need to deal with and will be reflected in the prices of calves and yearlings and uh, will be a driver of the margins in the next two years ahead. And uh, we shouldn't bank that uh, we've cyclically turned higher on cow-calf returns. Uh, They're still uh, under some pressure from the supply side. And Jim, the best to you and yours during this Thanksgiving break ahead. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Eric. It's been my pleasure. He is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center. To remind you once more, that is a service co-sponsored by K-State and numerous other land-grant universities. Jim Robb with this week's cattle market analysis and comment for you on this Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer here at the 50th year of K-State Swine Day. And with us now we have one of the speakers who presented this afternoon, U.S. Territory Manager and Swine Nutrition Specialist with Just Stahl, Hyatt Frobos. Good to have you on. Thank you. Your topic was transitioning to loose house gestating sows and proper management was one theme that went through and through your presentation. And will you give us a brief synopsis of how that is important with this topic? So management is something that's obviously important in stall house sows as well. But when we talk about group housing, we add a few more X factors to the management puzzle. And from a day-to-day management of sows in groups, we have some things that are changing from stalls where we need to get every sow up each day. We need to identify those that aren't eating and and figure out why they're not eating and and make sure that they begin eating or they get removed from the pen due to lameness or or loss of pregnancy. And uh, I think in general we really need to make sure that the staff that are doing the daily management tasks of sows and group house sows understand how to manage them properly and understand the level of stockmanship that's required in pens versus stalls. There's some challenges with group housing such as aggression during mixing that we need to understand and try to minimize as much as possible. What is a benchmark as far as producers thinking about building new? You gave a good rule of thumb. What would you advise? The number that I referenced was due to economic analysis at the University of Minnesota in 2010 that found that based on the value and age of the barn, generally speaking, if a barn is over 21 years old, you're probably better off tearing it down and building new rather than retrofitting the facility. If it's younger than that, then there's definitely some opportunity to maybe capitalize on an existing facility and converting it to pens. And there are some opportunities with renovations and building new. Of course, new technology can be incorporated. There's some varied feeding options. One question to be asking would be the stocking density or how big are these groups going to be coming into a facility? How do you go about walking through a producer's considerations? 
Yeah, well, definitely stocking density is a gray area for a lot of people. And I would say that one of the bigger concerns for people who are attempting to retrofit their facility is, can I maintain the same number of sows? Obviously, from a cash flow and efficiency standpoint, reducing the sow herd would be less than ideal. And so, uh, when possible, we had tried to design pens in retrofit facilities that utilize a lot of the alleyways that currently exist. And that usually allows us to get more square footage that allows equivalent productivity to sows and stalls. And generally, the recommendations would find that if you can get around 20 to 20.5 square foot for sows and are over 18 square foot for gilts, you can generally achieve equivalent production if you do your other pieces of the puzzle properly. So in retrofits, I think that's a key consideration is pen design and how to utilize your existing space. In a new construction, we've got a bit of a blank slate, but one of the things I talked about was going above and beyond, going overboard on space is going to cost you a lot of money. And I did a comparison with one of the builders of a recent sow farm and they told me that adding an extra square foot above and beyond the necessary level, you know, that already has the water and feed and gating, adds about 20 to $25 per square foot to do that. You take that times a 2,500 head sow herd, that's a big investment if that's not going to yield any additional productivity or welfare benefit to the sow. And let's discuss some of those other pieces to the puzzle here, some of the pin design aspects. Let's start off with flooring and slatting. What are some successful notes that people should be aware of? Yeah, pen design has a lot of different factors that are important. I would say some of those are water location and type. In general, you want to make sure that waters are located in activity areas. And if it is a partially slatted floor, you need to make sure that the water is located over the slatted areas because dry floors are much better for sow feet and leg health. And we want to try to create activity zones and nesting zones in the pen. Sows like to lay around the perimeter of the pen or in nesting areas. So we want to try to locate the waters away from that to create proper activity and nesting and eating zones. That being said, other pen factors such as nesting walls are good when used properly, but sometimes too many can be worse than not enough. And location of the feed station and minimizing choke points is something that's really important as a way to make sure that we aren't inadvertently causing increased aggression in the sows. A side note to the feeding areas, something that can often be overlooked is lighting. Will you touch on that for a moment? Yeah, definitely lighting is something that can be a problem in any type of feed system that requires sows to pass through an area. Pigs don't have great eyesight, and so shadowy areas cause them to balk or not want to go through there. And if that's where they have access to feed, this can often be a problem for timid animals. Adding a light over top of the feed station or in a retrofit facility, positioning the feed station when possible under an existing light is something that can help reduce the problems that would be associated with darkness. And in some areas, there's actually mandates that there has to be darkness for a certain length of time. In that case, you might want to have two different zones in the pen. Good for producers to note. Another thing might be the hospital or TLC pins. Those are another important portion of planning out a facility that can be effective and Will you comment on some of the highlights that you presented discussing that? Yes, I think hospital and and TLC pens are something that often gets overlooked when we're talking about converting to pens, and it's an important thing to not overlook because no matter what type of pen housing or feed system you use, there's going to be animals that need removed due to lameness or loss of body condition or other problems. Generally speaking, competitive feed systems like floor feeding or shoulder stanchions Most researchers would say 10 to 15% of those spaces need to be allocated for hospital for removals, whereas a non-competitive feed system such as a traditional ESF or free access ESF is going to have maybe 3 to 5% of those spaces allocated. So definitely an advantage there for those feed systems in that respect, but we need to make sure we allocate that space and place it close to the pens so that when we do need to take a lame animal out, she doesn't have to walk far in a lame state but also placing that in an area that has some traffic of people from day to day to make sure that those animals get some day to day attention and hopefully recover from whatever caused them to be placed in the hospital pen in the first place. The transition from stalls to pens is also affecting the staff and some of the older sows. How would you suggest that management be thorough in preparing at least the staff to be taking mind of these transitions? Just focusing on the pigs real quick, if we're retrofitting an existing facility and we want to keep sows on the farm, which is good from a cash flow standpoint, they, the farm can continue to produce. Uh, one of the challenges is, is we're typically dealing with older sows that oftentimes have been in stalls their whole life and maybe have some lameness problems or feet and leg problems that make them less likely to succeed in pens. 
That can be one of the challenges, especially during the first parity of their time in pens. So understanding that there's going to be a little higher removal rate and some sows that maybe won't make that transition, that's just something to be good to understand in the first place. But then the staff standpoint is really important because a lot of times a mandate to group housing is coming down from a packer or from a state level, and usually the owner is shouldering that burden and, and the financial investment of conversion. But the guys at the slat level are the ones that are having to execute that transition. And when we already have potentially problem sows and a staff that, you know, isn't necessarily excited about the transition, that can be a recipe for problems. And so clear communication, making sure that they understand what the expectation should be in the short term versus the long term. Those are the kind of conversations up front that really help make those transitions more successful and less stressful. So it ties back again to this idea of proper management as the transitioning is going on. If people are interested and want more information, what types of resources would you suggest they look into? Are there any publications or data that you also cited that you think would be very useful? Yeah, there's a lot of resources out there in the literature that draw off of some different experiences with sow housing. Generally speaking, I think to receive practical management advice, I think reaching out to your local extension office, the university level, they're going to be able to point you to some good resources that are data-driven. But also talking to builders who have built sow farms and been through that experience or other sow farms that have already been through the group housing transition, they can probably do a post-mortem on their experience and, and really tell you what they did well and what they did poorly. But there's a lot of resources available and reaching out to people and institutions that can help are probably the best guidance for your specific conversion process. And you'd see this transition as an opportunity for the swine industry to grow and improve, would you? Yes, it's definitely something that offers some challenge, but it also offers an opportunity to rethink and potentially inject some more stockmanship into our production system. You know, we constantly battle finding good people in hog farms. If we can maybe change that work environment or utilize new technology, maybe that's a way to attract some younger people or have higher employee retention rates. And so, you know, some of these things can have a silver lining, even though there is a financial investment to the conversion. But generally speaking, all of the data that I've come across would say that when properly managed and implemented, sows in group housing can yield productivity equivalent to sows housed in stalls. And as one closing thought here, you talked about the financial investment that this is. That is no secret to anyone looking at these systems, but this was something that you'd mentioned in your presentation. It is important that these producers consider the long-term effects of these facilities. Yeah, I I think one thing, especially producers that have multiple farms, you know, there is a cost for the conversion. And so making sure to maybe stratify that out over multiple years, if possible, is important rather than waiting till the deadline and then having to make a rash decision. That being said, uh, you know, some of these feed systems or pen designs might be cheaper in the short term, but might cost you daily in terms of wasted feed, increased body condition variation, more removals and sows exiting the herd. And so, You definitely need to evaluate the options that are presented to you and figure out what's going to be the right investment from a return standpoint over the life of this barn or or retrofitted facility. Thank you for coming on and speaking with us. Thank you for the opportunity. Once again, that was U.S. Territory Manager and Swine Nutrition Specialist with Jestall, Hyatt Frobos, one of the guest speakers here for the 50th K-State Swine Day. I'm Sarah Moyer here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is the K-State Radio Network, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Now for you today's agricultural news headlines in brief, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, the Senate Finance Committee did finish marking up its tax overhaul bill late last week, paving the way for it to go to the Senate floor after the Thanksgiving break. The House passed its tax bill on Thursday as well. The House bill passed by a vote of 227 to 205, 13 Republicans joining all Democrats in voting against it. The Senate Finance Committee approving its bill at the end of the four-day markup. Senate Agriculture Committee Chairman Pat Roberts of Kansas voted for the bill and praised the provisions that he said would provide tax relief for middle-class families. He said he's also, in his words, proud of the pro-growth provisions secured in the bill for farmers and ranchers, especially during this tough economy. He did not provide details on those, however. Reaction from agricultural groups to passage of the House bill was mixed, especially because of the removal of the Section 199 Domestic Production Activities Deduction. The president of the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, Chuck Connor, continues to argue that elimination of that deduction would reduce the flow of $2 billion in economic value that, as he put it, will flow out of rural America at a time when farmers and their local communities are struggling through the fourth year of stagnant prices. Connor added that as the Senate Finance Committee continues to mark up its own tax reform package, that they urge them to ensure that producers and their co-ops will not see their tax Tax burdens increased, while other sectors, from banking to technology, enjoy lower tax bills, in his words. Still, the leadership at the American Farm Bureau Federation praised passage of the House bill. The president of the Federation, Zippy Duval, said the House passage puts us one step closer, he says, to a tax code that works for all farmers and ranchers. He went on to say that lower rates, combined with the preservation of small business expensing, like in-kind exchanges and the business deductions for state and local taxes are just a few of the things they're pleased to see in that legislation. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association, President Craig Uden, a Nebraska cattle producer who had campaigned for provisions that would double the exemption for the estate tax immediately and end it in five years, said the bill is a step in the right direction, but still creates, as he put it, undue and unfair burdens for certain segments of our industry. He praised the preservation of the step-up in the basis upon inheritance and provisions to fully expense the cost of new investments, increased at 179 small business expensing limits and expand cash accounting. Uden noted, though, that the bill would also significantly limit the ability of some businesses from deducting their interest expenses. He said this could be a big problem for some members of the cattle production business. The National Farmers Union said the bill would increase the federal deficit and jeopardize farm program funding. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Michael Conaway did not comment on the bill. However, House Agriculture Ranking Member Colin Peterson did did. He said he supports making the corporate tax rate more competitive and simplifying the tax system, but he also noted the bill would add at least $1.5 trillion to the federal deficit over the next decade. He also said the bill would complicate taxes for people who use certain pass-through business structures. Peterson said that we can lower the corporate tax rate, but shouldn't do it at the expense of individual deductions or the elimination of Section 199 or the wind power credit. Some consistent and some unanticipated trends involving rural demographics are contributing to year-over-year declines in rural populations. Here's a closer look at that from the USDA's Rod Bain. Why has the population in rural America declined for six consecutive years? USDA economic researcher John Cromarty says a myriad of factors are behind this trend, starting with... Population growth from natural change is no longer large enough to offset the population loss we're seeing from net migration. While the trend of young adults leaving rural areas for career or living in urban areas continues to be long-term, it in turn has aged the remaining rural populations. So you're going to have fewer births and more deaths, all things being equal. Rural women are having fewer children on average. Plus, there has been increased mortality rates among young adult demographics in rural America. This trend is more recent and unanticipated from around 2000 to 2014. Mortality rates increased for people ages 20 to 50. And in particular, you have a 20% increase in mortality rates for 25 to 29-year-olds. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Now, this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester Bob Atchison. Bob? 
Our natural areas in Kansas provide many benefits to humans by buffering the effects of pollution, protecting water quality, preventing soil erosion, improving land values, and for outdoor recreation. They are also havens of biological diversity, which provide critical habitat for rare and declining species. A natural areas inventory conducted by the Kansas Biological Survey has identified high-quality sites in Douglas, Johnson, Leavenworth, Miami, and Wyandotte counties. A high-quality natural area supports plant and animal communities that may have existed prior to European settlement. The inventory identified 126 high-quality prairie sites and 24 high-quality forest sites. The criteria used for high-quality sites includes the size of the natural area, the degree the site has been disturbed by human activity, and biological diversity, that is, how many different kinds of plants and animals live there. The majority of high-quality forest types were oak hickory, followed by cottonwood sycamore, post and blackjack oaks, ash elm hackberry, maplewood basswood, and pecan hackberry. Rare animal species that are known to likely occur there in these high-quality forests are the eastern chipmunk, the southern flying squirrel, curlian and yellow-throated warblers, red-shouldered and broad-winged hawks, whippoorwill, broad-headed skink, red-bellied and smooth earth snakes, and the timber rattler. Some understory plant species associated with high-quality forest sites include yellow lady slipper, Canadian wild ginger, and northern maidenhair fern. Unfortunately, these high-quality natural areas are located close to the Kansas City region, which is projecting a population increase of a half million people in the next 20 years, which will consume an estimated 260,000 acres. However, landowners interested in conserving and managing these important natural areas do have options, such as conservation easements to prohibit development and USDA conservation programs like EQIP to encourage their management. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service encouraging you to join us in the protection and management of all Kansas natural resources. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. And this is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is the K-State Radio Network, and next up, this week's Kansas 4-H segment, turning to the Dog Project, once again, one of the more popular project areas in Kansas 4-H, year in and year out. But that activity is always in need of adults to serve as judges at the various dog events around Kansas. And there is a special training opportunity for individuals so inclined. We'll talk about that now with Daryl Waldron. As you know, Daryl is the Research and Extension 4-H Specialist for K-State based in northwest Kansas. He oversees this dog judges certification, recertification, and training. The project itself, though, Daryl, it continues to gain steam with youth in Kansas, right? Yes, it's one of our um, top ten projects that we have in Kansas, and um, 4-H dog care and training is extremely popular, and this provides a way for us to help people in a variety of ways. And foremost would be that we're always looking for more adults and, and also some teenagers to be dog judges at 4-H dog shows around the state. But it also gives a chance for adults or teens to just learn about the information in the training part so they can go through the training part and not have to go through the judge's certification part. Along with that, we ask that judges that haven't been certified in a while go through recertification from time to time. And there is an event to cover all of these contingencies coming up in the latter part of January of the new year. But what is all entailed with respect to dog judges certification and training? Well, it's a three-day event. starts on a Friday night and goes through Sunday afternoon. 
and uh, the participants, whether they be there for the certification, the recertification, or just the training part, they can be trained in all four disciplines, which would include agility, obedience, rally obedience, and showmanship, or they can pick and choose if they want to do just Saturday only or Sunday only or just a specific discipline of the four that I mentioned. So we will be in January 26th to 28th at the Sedgwick County Extension Center in uh, West Wichita. We um, will be there to do all the training. Well, do, if you would, Daryl, walk us through that agenda and the particular sessions that will be held there. Okay. Um, We'll start about 5 p.m. on Friday night with registration and check-in. People will have to eat before they arrive. From 6 to 9, we'll be covering the nuts and bolts of being a judge. I'll cover a little bit on experiential learning model and a few other things. On Saturday, we start at 8. In the morning, we'll have showmanship and then move on to obedience. We'll have lunch on site. And then Saturday afternoon, 1 to 5, we'll have showmanship continued and obedience also continued. For those that are in the certification or recertification, they actually have a practicum where they have to practice judging. And we'll have dog teams there with 4-H members and their dogs where they actually have live dogs with the the dog team so that they get practice really judging and and make it as uh, realistic as we can. Then on Sunday from 8 to noon, we'll have rally obedience, and then noon, lunch provided again, and then 1 to 4, we'll be covering agility, and then we wrap it up. So it's a really a fast-packed, full weekend, but in that Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, they can be trained in all four disciplines, get the practice that they need, and hopefully have the confidence then to go out and judge dog shows around the state. And in fact, potential dog show judges that go through this training and certification, they will actually, during the course of this event, score some classes, you say, to test their abilities, correct? Right. They get critiqued on how well they did. Did did they see things or did they miss major things? And, you know, occasionally somebody doesn't pass that discipline because they, they just are missing too many things, though the vast majority are certified in all the four the disciplines that they are trying in. And for those who have been previously certified, at what interval do they need to be recertified, Daryl? Well, we ask them every five years, and um, after five years, some things have changed, and that's why we ask for people to come back through it again to remain on our judge's certification list. And as, in as far as uh, prerequisite, having a, a familiarity with dogs, dog judging, training, need they have background before they even take this on, or can they start basically as novices? They could start as a novice, though there would be a lot of information to assimilate. And we do have some that just choose to go through the training part and, and don't want to become judges. But sometimes throughout the training, they change their mind and, and go ahead and get certified to judge because it is the, the same cost and the same program other than those on the training part don't have to do the practice judging like all those that are being certified for the dog judges training. So somebody that is a project leader would like to know more about how the intricacies of the project work. This would be a great opportunity for that. Would be an excellent opportunity, even if they didn't want to judge. So, you know, it's geared for extension agents, volunteer 4-H leaders, teen leaders, and then people who just want to be judges, which they could be affiliated with 4-H. Most would be, but they wouldn't necessarily have to be. Well, once again, it's coming up in January. That means that the registration for this is going to be due fairly soon, is it not? It has opened, and the cost for full-time for both the judge's certification as well as just for the training part is $95, and that includes all four disciplines, two lunches, four breaks, the practice judges. We have a guideline or a guidebook which has all of the proceedings of what's covered. All of those materials are included in this $95 cost. The only thing not included would be the hotel cost, which would be made separately by the, each participant. If you want to come just on Saturday or Sunday, the cost is $55 for each day. And again, you get all the printed materials, one lunch and two breaks. And if you just want to come for a specific discipline like showmanship, agility, rally obedience, or obedience, then it's just $35 per discipline. Again, you get the appropriate materials as well as the lunch and a break during the time that you're there. And one can register presumably online then? Yes. The easiest way to find it would be to go to the Kansas 4-H website, which is www.kansas4-h.org. So again, that's kansas4h.org. Under the right navigation bar, there's a What's Hot. Click on that, and you'll see 
the judge's certification and training and click on that link and it'll take you directly to the registration site. And those are due in by when? Uh, we say January 16th is when registrations are going to be due. That is the 2018 Kansas 4-H Dog Judges Certification, Recertification, and Dog Project Training, which will take place in Wichita January the 26th through the 28th at the Sedgwick County Extension Center. If you're interested in supporting the 4-H Dog Project in these capacities, by all means, be part of this workshop. Daryl, we appreciate the preview. Many thanks to you. Thank you, Eric. Great talking with you today. Likewise, Daryl Waldron with us. Daryl is the Research and Extension 4-H Specialist, 4K State, based in Northwest Kansas. Again, all details on this workshop, including the registration procedure, at kansas4h.org. That is this week's 4-H segment for you and our time for today's edition. As always, thanks for being along with us, and please rejoin us right here tomorrow, won't you? Until then, and for Sarah Moyer, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.